Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Jimmy Dore Show. We have special guest in-house, hilarious comedian Judah Friedlander is here. Hey, Judah, how are you? Incredible. Yeah. <laughs> you know, just fighting fascism in America. And, uh, you know, this is the number one third world country. And, <laughs> and I'm here to fight for it. I'm ready. I'm on the West Coast. This is my, this is my first in-studio appearance. Oh, really? Because I've... I've I've oh, Skyped in before, but with this our is the show. first time I'm actually it's, here. It's great to have you. It's really great to have you yeah. in person. Now, let me let people know what's happening. You have a uh, you have a big show coming out on Netflix on October 31st. That's Halloween. That's Tuesday. Yeah. He's going to be... His new special is America is the Greatest Country in the United States. That's what it's called. That's correct. Which is already funny. Yes, thanks. It's it's one of the jokes yeah. in, in the special. It's uh, 84 minutes, black and white filmed it in like a real low budget documentary kind of style but there's no interviews it's basically an 84 minute stand up performance film and it, filmed over different nights in New York and it's all pretty much you know satire on uh, all the big issues uh, in the country and the world I'm actually going to play a little bit of your special right now oh okay now we've played your stand up on our show unsolicited before because you have such a great bit about the Columbus Day Columbus Day right that was an old one right? yeah right and uh, same cl same venue. Uh, yes, correct. S same venue. Same venue. I yes. mean, it's like a <laughs> yeah. And uh, so here we go. Here's so here. Let's let's enjoy some of it. Now, I've seen this already. I laughed twice. I've seen it twice. I laughed both times. Let's okay. see if I laugh in the third time. Okay. <laughs> Where are you from? England. England. At one point in history, you used to own the whole world. What happened? <laughs> and I don't think you were an evil imperialistic nation. I think you were simply a country that was in search of better tasting cuisine. I, uh, I think one day your troops wandered over to India, took a lunch break, and were like, wow, this curry is just dandy. Let's take this recipe back to the queen. And then your general stepped in and said, no, this is too good. We should surround this nation with our troops and protect this chicken tikka masala recipe. Make sure it stays authentic. England, you used to own us. Yeah, you did. You used to own us. And then we defeated you. Took your language. And perfected it. <laughs> you got nothing left. Your last piece of dignity. David Beckham, he lives here. He named his son Brooklyn. It's over. <laughs> well, just... Showing England how you know we're very funny. We're, we're still number one, but it you know the the special gets into, you know, in a in a you know similar satirical way. You know, all the big issues. You know, from mass incarceration, to healthcare, climate change, uh, you name it. You know, so so you uh, you cover all the bases now. Judah, I we also have your coffee table book, which also talked on social uh, or yeah. was about social issues in a, uh, a yeah, a lot of it was yeah yeah. And um, so now you're a very successful actor. Of course, a lot of people know you from uh, Thirty Rock, which I found out gets more views online than it did on television. That's what I heard from myself <laughs> when I think I told that to you. I think yeah. you did. It's amazing. It's yeah. an amazing. But that's what I heard. That's what I heard. That's yeah. what I heard from you. Yeah, because I heard when the show was on. <laughs> I heard that like our ratings weren't that good, but online or like DVR or whatever, we, we did well. Now, um, even though you're, you've had such success in show business and you are a world champion athlete, mm -hmm. you still find yourself homeless. Uh, yeah, well, technically, I don't have a place to live right now. <laughs> uh, August 31st was the last time I had a, a place to live. I, um, and you didn't renew your lease. Why? Well, I've been trying to move and buy a place. I've never owned. You never and owned a place. One thing I've learned over the years is that if you don't own, you actually don't have any power. Uh, you know, with with gentrification, with corporatization of so many of the cities in this country, like like most young people in this country, especially the highly educated, the high income earning, they're all moving back to the cities from the suburbs. You yes. know, there's a, there's this reverse flight because you know. people figured out suburbs suck. There's nothing convenient about them, and you have to drive a 20 minutes to, to get anything you want. Right. You can't just open your door and go down to the 7-Eleven and pick up some milk and go back right. and have your cough. It's yeah. it's it's not it's suburbs suburbs suck. And for decades, you know, uh, people left uh, the cities. So yes. many people, and so many of the cities became 
uh, very low income, right. uh, very run down, hollowed out, and now uh, the reverse is starting to happen. So city prices are going up and up. And one thing I've learned, you know, I've been in New York thirty years, and it's like if you don't own, it's you, you're you're eventually going to be pushed out of the of the city. So I'm trying to just get something, right, before it's impossible, right, because you know, it's. Yeah, with, without owning, you really don't have and rights because so, people complain, oh, my rent's going up. It's like, well, unfortunately, there's nothing. You have no rights if, if, if you don't own. You know, it's, it's scary. So, so. Talk, talk, talk about what's happened to New York since you've lived there. Like, what, what do you think happened? We were just talking about this before we started this interview about, no, I made, the, I, 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 it, what's happening here in Los Angeles and I think in San Francisco was a lot of foreign investment. Now, I don't know what's been happening in New York. Tell me, what do you think is happening? They say it's all foreign investment in New York. You know, it's, it's uh, Russians, it's Chinese, it's uh, Europeans coming in and uh, they're buying up these, you know, multi-million dollar apartments. But it's, uh, I, I don't know. I, I see just, like even the comedy clubs in New York, they're very busy. You know, there's, I remember in the early 90s, comedy clubs were slow in New York. Yeah. Both. And and there were actual dive bars in Manhattan. Right. Where you could go. There was a dive bar, yeah. Yeah, where the only people, there'd be three guys in there who, they looked like they were 80. I don't know how old they were. They could have been 45. Yeah. I, I don't know. But, you know, like career alcoholics at the bar. And then a completely empty bar. You won't see that in New York now. Every bar is body-to-body -body people just spending money. There's just, you know, New York City had eight years of Giuliani. It had 12 years of Bloomberg, which technically isn't even legal. Right. Eight years is the max. And then he did some stuff and got an extra four years. Right. And uh, so Bloomberg's goal was to make New York the financial capital of the world. And New York always had, you know, Wall Street's always been a presence in New York. And so there was always that, that big money in New York. But it was, in, it was on Wall Street. It was in, you know, certain pockets. Now it just seems like it's spread throughout all of Manhattan and through much of Brooklyn and uh, and part of Queens also. Citibank is headquartered in Queens now. No kidding. Yeah, and, and Long Island City, which is one of the first neighborhoods into Queens, it must have 15 or more skyscrapers at this point. There used to be zero. And this is just in the past five to 10 years. Really? So you now have, you probably have, the population there is probably, you know, 20, 10, I would guess 10 to 20 times what it was just 10 years ago. So there's no new infrastructure. So you so like if you get on the subway there, it'll always be body to body people no matter what time it is. And then when you get off the train, you actually often have to wait five to ten minutes just to leave the station because there's so many people just going up and down the stairs. Really? So it's crazy. So it's very, um, you know, so, no. like an average one bedroom in Manhattan might be a million dollars. So a two bedroom might be. Uh, 1.5? No, no, 2 million, you know, uh, it could be. You know, it could be less, yeah. but it could be 2 million. And we're not even talking 1,000 square feet, you know. So for, you can get a house in the Hollywood Hills for the same price as a two-bedroom in Manhattan. It's crazy. <laughs> it is crazy. Crazy. So it's and like... So then no one, by the way, no one seems to... Uh, care enough to have to demand a political solution to what's happening to our cities de blasio mayor of new york is trying and they have uh he has been doing some things to try to build more uh middle income and low income housing but that's also a problem because they're so the the neighborhoods that already have money they don't want low income housing coming in right so you'll actually have people protesting <laughs> affordable housing <laughs> I mean, it's terrifying. <laughs> you know, like people who never protest, they're finally getting <laughs> active and it's to protest affordable housing. So it's, I, I don't know this. And people also say that the homelessness is is rising quite a bit in New York City. So it's it's that thing, you know, the it's what's been going on. The, well, homelessness. The, the, rich, the rich getting richer and the poor getting greater, a more amount of them and poorer. It's it's crazy. Well, what's crazy to me in here in Los Angeles is uh, previously, you know, I take the same route from Pasadena into downtown Chicago, um, downtown L.A., and out where I get off now on the two, uh, there's people, there's a there's like a community now of homeless people underneath that bridge. That didn't used to be there. Interesting. And so now we're starting to do more things downtown, and uh, they're building a lot more downtown in L.A. A like lot of crazy. homeless got pushed out in downtown. So they're getting all pushed yeah. out, and we go by Skid Row, and I'm like, they just decided to spend $80 billion more a year on the, on the military. What would it take to fix the homeless problem in America? A billion dollars? 
yeah. two billion dollars yeah. tops to fix the homeless problem, give yeah. people homeless shelters. That's what that's what you do. They have all these weird room rules for homeless people. Well, first you have to go get off drugs, then we'll give you a house. No, they're on drugs because they don't have a house. Go give them a house first. Anyway, this I'm, what I'm trying to tell people is people have been told that this is not we can't fix these problems. Where oh, are you yeah. going to get the money not. from? You can't fix this problem. You can't send people to college for free. Yes, you can, and you can end homelessness. Yeah, without even tr- without blinking an eye, we could do that, right? And you can end wars too. And we know? can end the wars. <laughs> yeah. People go like, well, how do these other other countries? How do they do it? <laughs> I, I'm like, they don't have the military budget that we have, right? You know, and. You know, what do you think that all comes down to, Jude? I will, a lot of people say it's the way we can't finance our campaign certainly is a big problem, right? There's there's many things, and that's a, a huge one. But it's, you know, I don't think, I mean, I don't know any countries that have the war budget that we have. No. And You know Russia and, spend, You know how much Russia spends on their military? I know it's not nearly as much as us. $65 yeah. billion dollars a year. We just decided to spend $80 billion extra on top of what we were already spending. Yeah. And by the way, no debate about that. No, no. Sunday morning show discussions. No. no Ted Cruz and Bernie on the thing. No Anderson Cooper going around the country. No discussion. Just like that. Yeah, I, I find it shocking that. You know, with Trump in office and being as volatile as he is. Right. And, you know, you have such a a spoiled rich guy like that, this spoiled rich kid, you know, basically uh, Spalding from uh, Caddyshack. (laughs) You know, that's like who the president is. How is someone like that not going to want to use their toys? You know, I, I that, mean, you, that I, you give him. Yeah. You know, and, he, and he's openly talked about why can't we use nukes when, you know, when he was running? Yeah. Like, What's wrong with using nukes? So let's <laughs> use nukes. And I've already heard the term coming from some of the military and the mainstream media, this term tactical nukes. Yeah. Uh, that were these tactical nukes, which, oh, they don't they don't cause much problem. They're, they're tactical. They just do, you know, little, little little nukes here and there. And it's like it's very dangerous. And there's almost what I find shocking is there's there seems to be culturally almost no anti-war movement N- that's none. going on. Well, the the anti there, there was a anti war uh, wing of the Democratic Party at the DNC last summer. Yeah. And when Leon Panetta got up to speak, Leon Panetta, the former Secretary of Defense, Leon Panetta, who famously said uh, when he asked how many shooting wars are we in, he started laughing and said, "I don't know, I'll have to count." So when he got up to speak, uh, the, the anti war wing of the Democratic Party started to boo him. They turned the lights out on them and they put sound cannons on them. That's what the Democratic Party thinks of the anti-war movement. So, and and still, people wag their finger at me for voting for Jill Stein. Yeah, and, and, well, of course, and and they, unless they see the light, they will continue doing. doing and it. and yeah. I have to tell people until you understand the game that's being played, yeah. you will forever be bragging about voting for a corporatist warmonger yeah. Yeah. who's anti-union. Yeah, the other the other good point. The other thing about being shamed for voting for Jill Stein, which I find interesting, is. So many people that do that shaming, they don't realize that she ran before 2016. Also. Yes, <laughs> no, yeah. she ran in 2012. Yeah, nobody talks about this, uh, the the Russian infiltration in of 2012 in the 2012 campaign. Right. Y- you know. So I I just find that a little interesting. I, um, I find it very interesting too. <laughs> but it's like I went to a a few months ago in New York. I went to a a, a no war with North Korea rally. Great. And I think there were 20 people there. Oh. It was right outside the UN. And it's just. You're like, that's it? It's like, you know, it's just... Uh... Well, people, there's no media presence. Their, Dem- their Democratic Party are all pro-war. Yeah. Uh, Elizabeth Warren voted for that bloated military budget. You yeah. know, that she's... and there's So the people like Elizabeth Warren are just sheepdogs. They're yeah. just herding progressives into a Democratic Party. And as Shama Sawan told us, if you're a progressive, the roadmap for your movement meets a graveyard inside the Democratic Party. Yeah. And it's per- wow. th- there was a woman who ran for mayor as a Democrat in Baltimore. She ran on passing the $15 minimum wage. She got elected as a Democrat. She vetoed the $15 minimum wage. Why do you think she did that? Because she was told by the party, if you do this, it will be the end of you in this party. And so yeah. she, she vetoed it. That's why. Because I remember that. I didn't know that was the reason. Yeah. Well, I, you tell me what the yeah. reason is. No, well, I mean, I, I, it sounds like the reason to me. I didn't. I didn't know. She got know? elected on it, and yeah. then she d- vetoed it. So either she got completely corrupted by corporations, or the yeah. part. I'm, I'm going to guess it's both. The yeah. part. The party's anti-minimum fifteen dollar yeah. minimum wage. Yeah. They wouldn't put it in their platform. So in my stand-up special, I have one joke where I say, because uh, I talk about how I'm going to be the next president. I talk about my presidential platform. And I talk about how I'm going to raise the minimum wage to 15 bucks an hour, 
and I'm going to lower the maximum wage to fourteen fifty to, <laughs> to put put those CEOs in their place. Is people, it, is, people have so much power, and they don't even realize it. You know, how do people and, have power? Well, if if we're able to work together, we have power. Yeah, you well, know, there but, is an but, anti-war movement on the right, which is what helped get Trump elected. And there's an anti-war movement on the left, and that's why I think you know, I, uh, they, it's in their interest to foment. Uh, fighting between the far right and the far left, right? Even though we agree on anti-war stuff, because that's right. the most important thing is to keep the wars going. Uh, war always seems to make people money. Well, Barack yeah. Obama, they gave him a peace prize. <laughs> I know, as we're in seven different countries. And, and then he yeah. immediately ramped up the war in Afghanistan, started bombing Libya, put a hit on Osama bin Laden, dropped 26,000 bombs on Syria. And that's the thing about those peace prizes. Nobody ever tries to win a second one. Interesting. So no one, no one's had consecutive. No one's three peated. On I haven't the, heard uh, three peat yet on the uh, on the peace prize. <laughs> but it's unbelievable. I mean, uh, that this is Barack Obama then went on to torture Chelsea Manning. I remember the when uh, the uh, it was um, the Bin Laden speech that he gave when Bin Laden was taken out. Right. That was. I just remember. And believe me, I'm no fan of Bin Laden. But, but right. That was. That was an eerie yes. presentation. You know, he's just walking up there all alone, gives this speech, lets you know this person's been taken out. I'm like, it was eerie. Yeah, we shot yeah. him, dropped him in the ocean. See you later. Yeah, very eerie. <laughs> yeah. And that was a healing moment, by the way. He talks about that as being a healing moment when he uh, assassinated Osama Bin Laden. It helped people heal. That's what he said. It's a healing. So there's nothing more healing uh, than a an assassination ordered by the president. That really heals people. Yeah. it's. <laughs> and I remember, I can't remember if it was that night or when... Uh, Saddam Hussein was captured, but there were these celebrations going down at the White House. Right. It was mostly just drunk college kids. Drunk college kids. You know, I mean, literally just, you know, it, it really looked like from what you saw on TV, these weren't protesters. They weren't, these weren't activists. These were like, oh, we heard this. Hey, let's go there. And just, you know, just going crazy and partying. And, and I remember Brian Williams being on TV just talking about what a moment this yes! is for these kids. <laughs> right. Brian like, Williams, who got pretty much nutted in his pants when, when Trump Bomb Syria? Do you remember that? We are guided uh, by the beauty of our missiles. Yeah, that was. Uh, I saw that live when that was going on too, and that was that was just disgusting. What what uh, Brian Williams' commentary on that was. <laughs> that just... was be and and does he does he did. By the way, and no, no, there's no uh, fine for that. He didn't get suspended. For no, that. there's no, 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 no. Well, that's the thing with Trump with the whole fake news thing. You know where, um, you know the first of all, I mean. Trump misuses the fake. I think there's plenty of fake news in yes. mainstream media news. The, but the, the way Trump scare. uses it, it's he's using it in a, in a dishonest yeah. way. Uh, you, often. You, you, you know, it'll, it'll be because, uh, you know, he never mentions how the media, mainstream media, propped him up for a year and a half yeah. and basically handed him the election. Um, but, uh, you know, when you have Brian Williams still having a job who lied for years yeah. about war heroics that that he did that's called that, stolen that valor never happened what is that called stolen yes, valor yeah and 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 how he's allowed to still have a job is is well, unbelievable well what i thought was even worse than what brian that that you're right that was yeah that should get you because your whole thing as a news person is that you're you have integrity and you have yeah. an honest broker and you're going to tell the truth yeah well it's obviously he's not that guy yeah but the number the, the bigger thing was that not a lot of people know about is that all during the Iraq war, Brian Williams worked for General Electric. They owned NBC at that time. Right. And they were a huge defense contractor. Yeah. They got, they fired Phil Donahue at MSNBC right. because he was anti-war. Right. So legitimate my, anti-war. Legitimate. Yeah. They yeah. literally, and we, the memo came out. We know why they fired Phil Donahue from MSNBC. That's the lefty network. Yeah. They fired a guy because he yeah. was anti-war. And now yeah. you wonder why there's no anti-war yeah. people in the country anymore. Yeah. But what Brian Williams did, my question to him is, how many checks do you take from a defense contractor in the middle of an illegal war before you stop calling yourself a journalist? Yeah. Even worse, he would bring on generals, retired generals, retired. Yeah. They were supposed to give us a straight dope about what was happening in Iraq. But what they re really were doing was telling us why we needed to spend more money on and buy more stuff and have sure. more war because they were being paid by defense contractors. Right. Brian Williams never told us that. Yeah. But you got the guy who did tell us that in the New York Times won a Pulitzer Prize for it. Brian Williams still never told his audience that, even after it was exposed that they were doing that. Right. They still do that, by the way. 
they bring on retired generals to talk about war and they don't tell you they're being paid by defense contractors. And I think there's I think there's good retired generals out there who just don't speak to the media. The good you, ones you know, don't they don't bring out the ones who they, don't want more war. Right, right. The you ones know, who don't want more war, they're the, no of use. Right. They don't get jobs. Right. 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 They don't get commentator jobs. That's correct. Right. That's correct. Um they're fill, just like Phil Donahue. Nobody's yeah. beating down his door. Yeah. He had the number one show on the network, by the way, when they he fired him. He was a legend. Him. Yeah. <laughs> number one show on the network yeah. when they fired him. And they said it was because of poor ratings. The next live Jimmy Dore show is November 6th in Burbank, California, and November 12th in Portland, Oregon. Link for tickets right there.